I go ahead and share my screen? Please do, sorry. So thank you all for convening such a wonderfully rich conversation and for letting me be part of it. Um, you've heard a whole lot in the last little while, uh, last day or two, about the value of linked transactional data and particularly about U metrics. I'm here today to talk to you about the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science. IRIS is an IRB approved data repository housed at the University of Michigan that I direct and founded with Bruce and Julia um, precisely to do the kind of work that we've been talking about. This is the organization that anchors the community that builds and uses the Umetrics data. So the challenge you all heard, but it's worth going over again. Usually when I think about uh, the challenge of science policy and science's value, I think about this New Yorker cartoon. Money flows in, great stuff flows out, in the middle, a miracle happens. We know the miracle happens routinely and often, economic growth, public health benefits, skilled workforce, things like Tang. Um, these all come out of the innovation process, but we don't really understand step two. And if we can't understand it, we have very little chance of effectively explaining it and almost no chance of intervening to improve it. So I'm going to suggest that what we need to do and what we've been doing is to build the kinds of data that you've seen wonderful examples of. And that starts with the recognition that to understand step two, we have to know that grants on their own don't do much. Grants enable work, work trains people and creates new discoveries, skilled people and discoveries get applied all over society. And that's what creates the value. To build the kind of data that we need to see then, this example suggests we needed a bare minimum to bring together, in Frauka's or James's terms, a whole lot of aliens, probably nine different classes of data providers functioning under at least six different sets of, of restrictions, some with challenging histories, um, who have to get together voluntarily to do the hard work with researchers and communicators of building the kinds of data and community we need. This is the social organizational problem that IRIS was meant to solve. And its solution anchors on a laser focus on value from linked data to all participants. And so one of the things IRIS does is use these linked data to produce with our communities products of value to them on their terms for their use cases. Danny said this very well a second ago when he said, you don't wanna build the use case that you think someone should use. You wanna build the thing that they want now for a particular purpose and use that to leverage development. So these are some of the nine products that Iris has worked on and hands back. Uh, they use linked business and Umetrics data, the things on the left, linked Umetrics and employment and outcomes data, the things in the middle, and linked Umetrics and scientific productivity data, patents, publications, dissertations. These are some of the things that create value and that allow us to translate the findings from a really rich research community directly to the people who are providing the data and to other stakeholders. And the other stakeholders are important too. There are a lot of things that can be done once you can aggregate these kinds of data to speak to step two across many institutions. And because this is done in the context of a stable, professional, responsible, and secure production platform, it can often happen fast. I won't spend a ton of time on it, but two quick examples. Um, we were approached by government relations officers from a couple of our universities who'd gotten queries from Congress people who wanted data to help support enrolling co-sponsors for the RISE Act. We worked with them closely and with congressional staff. And two days later, we produced a set of research anchored, data anchored information briefs that the congressmen and congresswomen sent out and used to help enroll 187 bipartisan co-sponsors, right? The benefits of this for timely kinds of production of valuable things are really impressive, but they require that data providers, communicators, and researchers be able to find and talk to each other. 
One of the ways we make sure that happens is by continuing to have and to build strategic partnerships to actually make use of these data in interesting ways and expand the network. So on the right, you heard about our partnership with Collarage and CSES from Wan Ying yesterday. Our partnerships with Exceed and with CTSA hubs both take advantage of features of this data for understanding the impact of, in one case, large cyber infrastructure investments, and in the other, large investments in institutional and scientific infrastructure for translational research from NIH that are, by definition, multi-institutional, national in scale, and multidisciplinary, and that thus can't really be fully understood absent the kinds of data that we're talking about that span all those areas. The other thing that Bruce raised that comes out of these kinds of lovely, rich transactional data, the nitty gritty, is that you can put these things up against relevant counterfactual groups. So in both the CTSA and the Exceed cyber infrastructure case, we were looking at scientific impact with these partners of their programs relative to counterfactual groups of other funded scientists on these campuses that they helped us design. The partnerships don't always have to be with other technical groups or data providers. In the middle here, um, the IRIS Impact Finder, Emilda and also uh, Toby talked about the importance of compelling stories. Many of the communicators who can make the best use of the results of these data and help them have the kinds of effects that we need them to have can only work in ways that aren't deeply technical. And so we worked with our communications group to build a tool that allows communicators to find the leads for compelling stories that are grounded in and contextualized by data. And you can see an example of that here. In 1991, a researcher in kinesiology found that eight minutes a day of treadmill training for an infant with Down syndrome leads them to walk about four to six months faster than not. That's huge in developmental terms. And the university published a press release about it where they said, by the way, the treadmills cost about $1,200 each. They came back to us later and asked, what's the story of economic impact? And it turns out that these grants that supported this paper bought $70,000 worth of treadmills from a tiny engineering company that now has an entire line of business based on renting these treadmills to hospitals and selling them to families to improve health outcomes for super cute infants. And so the university can put together a story that ties the science, the public health, the human interest, and the economic impact, and can contextualize that story in ways that are really clear and data rich. These are the sources of value, but they're anchored on the heart of this, which is an active research community. One of the things that makes this work is that IRIS is a machine for identifying and translating new findings into idioms that can be used by everyone. One it's a solved problem of social organization that we have to solve. The problem, as I said, is that this has to be a voluntary organization. It has to be something that can't be centrally controlled. Paul mentioned the other day that data monopolies are dangerous, right? So did Jevin. And it has to be capable of doing challenging and sometimes complex work. And the way to do that, I think, as a sociologist is to think about two things. One is what we call generalized exchange. The notion that the value for any given participant here depends on access to resources that another owns, but the people that want they want access to information or data from aren't always the people that can give them what they need. Direct bilateral exchange doesn't work. We need generalized exchange. Open science is an, ex an exceptional model of this. And bilateral exchange under markets or centralized exchange under a hierarchy don't work terribly well in these situations. So we need a form of network governance. And this is a picture of IRIS that showcases the ways it's built to be and sustain a network that allows generalized exchange. And so if you do a simple equation, if you wanna build and sustain a community that can do complicated innovative work in responsible ways in a timely and transparent fashion across lots of different interests, you can't do it with hierarchy. You can't do it with direct reciprocity. You can't rely on altruism. You need generalized exchange plus network governance. And that raises a few difficulties that we need to guard against. Networks like markets and organizations can fail. Right? And they fail under two cases. 
Networks fail when partners screw each other or when they screw up, right? And that difference is instructive, right? So when individual participants in a network screw each other, they do so out of opportunism. We need to guard against that. And we need to guard against it by increasing the value of participation, decreasing the costs of participation and making malfeasance visible. Whole networks screw up when they close themselves off and become oligarchies, when there are too many special deals or special pleadings, and when we can't have transparent processes that are open and inclusive. There are solutions to that that are baked into the process, not the least of which is that an organization like IRIS should be dependent on the communities that it serves rather than independent of them. Individual participants screw up when they don't have the competencies or capabilities to pay off the risky and difficult collaborations that they enter. And the answer to that is not to avoid people who don't have those competencies, it's to provide the training and capacity building and support to make a truly inclusive and rich community that can do this kind of work possible. And networks as a whole screw up when they calcify when they get too caught up in their current successes and fail to remain open to new ideas and new partnerships and new directions. And we can fix that by engaging in community-driven design and by ensuring that the research community and its interests drives the directions of much of the development of IRIS. And so if we wanted to think about what the overall lessons for cultivating community of this are, it's a laser focus, absolute laser focus, on transparency, timeliness, and value, mechanisms to guard against opportunism and to make misbehavior more costly than good behavior, accessible and inclusive training to support capacity building and limit the likelihood of screw ups, transparent, fair, and open procedures to limit the possibility of oligarchy, oligarchy ongoing partnerships with lots of different communities and a vibrant research arm to ensure that we don't calcify. Thanks very much.